Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. And today I have a very distinguished uh, guest, Dr. Shoaib Ahmed Malik. Welcome to Blogging Theology, sir. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate you inviting me to Blogging Theology. Well, and um, uh, th this, this is a very special um, video, I think. Uh, in this video, um, Dr. Shoaib is going to be discussing his recent work, uh, a book entitled Islam and Evolution. Al-Ghazali and the Modern Evolutionary Paradigms, published by Rutledge Science and Religion series. By the way, um, uh, Dr. Shervish very generously agreed to put a link to uh, his book, which is available free of charge, quite legally, in the description below. So you can download it and read it. The, uh, the Rutledge publishers are okay with that. Um, so um, Dr. Shoaib is um, a professor and he is assistant professor of the natural sciences at Zayed University in Dubai. And he researches exclusively on the topics of science and religion, atheism and Islamic theology. And he's a specialist, uh, clearly a specialist on Islam and evolution. And this is an incredibly controversial subject amongst Muslims and also amongst Christians and many Jews as well. And this book is, uh, I've read the endorsements on the back, and I'll let you have a look. Some of the leading scholars in the world have read this book and endorsed it. Muslim scholars and top academics and specialists at Oxford University and other universities have read this and give it glowing commendations. So this really is a, a very mainstream academic work uh, tackling head on the whole issue of Islam and evolution. So without any more ado, I, I'll hand over um, the show to uh, Dr. Shoaib, who will take us through Islam and evolution with a, a series of slides and, 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 uh, and a talk about it. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. So um, uh, as uh, Paul uh, kindly uh, mentioned in his introduction, I mostly focus on the interaction of science and religion. And what I'm about to present is just a uh, summary of my own book, um, that was uh, released this year with Rutledge uh, back in May. Um, so this is the overview uh, of the presentation. Uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, that's the front cover of my book. It's open access. That means you can download it for free and legally. Um, somebody paid for it um, uh, for it to be available anywhere in the world. Um, so no matter where you are, it is an accessible item that has no paywalls behind it. It's absolutely free. You can download it as a PDF. So... Um, uh, for today's conversation, what I'd like to do is just go over um, six main areas uh, just to kind of clear the air and then, you know, hopefully build up my uh, case for what I think uh, can be made sense of when it comes to the topic of Islam and evolution. So first and foremost, I'd like to just provide a very basic overview of the science of evolution. So what do we mean by evolution when we're talking about it in this context? Uh, because whenever I say the word evolution, people automatically think naturalism, atheism, fascism, whatever have you. So I just want to kind of provide a baseline that we can all work with. Very good. Following that, I then want to move on to um, a, a, a social media controversy where people are referring to a certain group of scientists to say, hang on, there's a bunch of scientists here uh, behind this movement that are questioning neo-Darwinism. Therefore, evolution is a theory in crisis. So I want to address that and nip that in the bud before we go any further, because there is a, a huge misconception in that, in, in that articulation that I want to clarify here. I'll then um, highlight the approach that I've taken in this piece of work, um, and it's by no means definitive. I, I welcome other approaches, but I'm just clarifying how I have entertained the discussion. And then um, I introduce uh, four positions which I created when I was going through the literature. So if you if you read about the various um, opinions, you know, the people have written on the topic of Islam and evolution, I went through that and I said, okay, these are four positions that we can identify and then you know, through which we can make, uh, you know, we, which we can navigate the conversation of Islam and evolution. I then move on to what I believe are theologically valid positions out of these four. And finally, because Paul stressed that he would like to go through intelligent design, um, I've uh, introduced that there as well, so we can go over um, how I think intelligent design works in this conversation. So that's and, and, and also, you said to me before we started, there's a difference in your view between intelligent design as a theory, as an approach, and creationism, uh, which is something distinct. Uh, and uh, you're going to clarify the difference between creationism and intelligent design, perhaps. 
Sure. So uh, just to be clear, the, the, the distinction between creationism and intelligent design is not something that I have carved out. It is the ID proponents themselves have carved out. Okay. They make it very clear that they are not creationists. They make it very clear in their own works. And creationists themselves have tried to move away from intelligent design. <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not that they're synonymous. It's that there are very clear stipulations of what is intelligent design and what is um, uh, uh, creationism. No, they're not, they're not necessarily opposing one another, but members are very clear in drawing the boundaries between the two. But we'll get to that. Uh, we're we'll beating the punchline. We'll get to that. Yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. Okay. So um, let's start off with a basic outline of what we mean by evolution. So the way I try to simplify this for, for the wider audience is through three propositions. Deep time, common ancestry, and then the mechanisms or the mechanics of evolution. Uh, for me, if these are enough to kind of get the conversation starting, I don't go into any further detail about the 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 endro uh, you know the viruses the DNA. I, for me, that that's irrelevant. I just want to explain enough of the science so that we can start engaging with the theological conversation. So I'm not interested in going into the science further than these three propositions. Okay. So with that said, let me explain what these three propositions are. Evolution requires that the earth is really old, a concept known as deep time. Previously, I mean, if you go back a couple hundred years ago, people thought that the earth was around six to 10,000 years, right? Mostly because of uh, uh, Archbishop James Usher, who kind of, you know, went through the patriarchs uh, in the Bible and kind of guesstimated that uh, the Bible indicates that the earth is around six to 10,000 year, years old. And, and even in Quranic translations, even a, even a modern one that I, I read, you know, seven years ago, I still see in brackets 6,000 years ago. So you wow. do see these, te you, you do see these um, uh, in, in contemporary works within Quranic uh, translations. Yeah. Um, so the, the idea that the time, that, that time is much, much older than we anticipated is the concept known as deep time. So that's the first proposition of evolution. The second proposition of evolution is what makes this a distinctive theory in comparison to anything that we've entertained in the past. In the past, there was this general understanding, uh, at least uh, across the three Abrahamic faiths, that um, God created each species separately and instantaneously. So humans, boom, instantaneous creation. Lions, boom, instantaneous creation. Cats, boom, instantaneous creation, right? Um, you get this, you so get this in Genesis chapter one, don't you? Where God, God creates in, in six or seven days, rests on the last day. He creates this, yeah. this, he creates that. And on the next day he creates in 24 hour periods, quite distinctively uh, in that time frame. So, yeah, sorry. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, now that is what is challenged by the theory of evolution. Um, Charles Darwin was not the first person who kind of came up with the idea, but he gave it a very clear explanation. But in a nutshell, common ancestry says that just like all of us have a mother and father, our mothers, our parents, they have a mother and father, our grandparents have a mother and father. And if we keep going back, we get this family tree network. Evolution just takes it to the next step. They just say that just like you have a family tree network within your family, there's also a family network when it comes to all biological life, which means that humans, bugs, um, leopards, cheetahs, trees, whatever have you, anything that's biologically existing or has existed in the past is connected in this biohistorical lineage since the beginning of life, three and a half billion years ago. So common ancestry in a nutshell is every biological entity is somehow connected in this family-like network. That's what common ancestry means. And, and this is where you get the concept of macroevolution, species evolving into other things over time, right? So um, did you want to say anything or add anything to that, Paul? No, that's, that's great so far. Thank you. Great. Okay. And then the final thing, and this is the, this is the part of evolution which gives it a Darwinistic rendition. The mechanisms of evolution. So what, what is it that makes evolution tick? What is the engine of evolution? Um, in Charles Darwin's time, when he, when he proposed this theory, we have to make it very clear that the concept of genes did not exist in his time. It, right. it simply did not exist. So when he first proposed the theory of evolution, all he proposed was this idea of natural selection, that when you have you know, a given number of species in a particular climate, the, the species that can acclimatize or adapt to that environment will survive, and species that cannot adapt to that environment will eventually die off. So the, the natural settings are like a filter, and whatever is able to get through lives on, what doesn't get through dies out. That's natural selection in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually, after Darwin's death in the 20th century, 
um, the idea of genetics came to uh, uh, the scientific surface. And they eventually found out that actually this concept of genes and random mutations in, your, in, your, in, 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 in explaining inheritance and variation, this can be plugged into the theory of evolution. And when natural selection and random mutation uh, were merged along with a few other things, this is what came to be known as neo-Darwinism or the modern synthesis. So Darwinism is just natural selection. Neo-Darwinism is natural selection plus random mutation. And this is the definition of evolution that I will be using whenever I talk about it for the rest of the presentation. Okay, good, yeah. very clear, very clear so far. Yeah, so always keep in mind that whenever we now talk about evolution, these three propositions must constantly spring in your mind. Deep time, common ancestry, and then the mechanics are natural selection plus random mutation. Okay, so with evolution cleared out in terms of how I've defined it and how most people define it, right? Um, there is now a social media controversy uh, that I've experienced in many different Facebook groups. I know that there's Twitter, there's this new thing called Clubhouse. I'm not in any of those, right? I just prefer to stick to Facebook. Call me old-fashioned, but that's just me, right? I, I just don't have the time. You're old-fashioned, but it might be the saniest thing to do. I've been on Clubhouse, and it could be it could be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. No, I mean, like, um, uh, apparently there's more. There's, like, what is it, Instagram, there's Snapchat, there's all these other social media oh. outlets, right? Yeah. And I, my mind is already so invested into just university work and academic life. I don't have the time to invest in no, my time in anything else. Apart from yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's just, it just sucks your time out. Anyways, from what I'm, I'm sure that this is going to be replicated in other social media platforms, but on Facebook, I have come to see that many people refer to a group of scientists um, known as the third way right? Or uh, uh, they embody a movement known as the extended evolutionary synthesis. And they refer to these scientists to say, hang on, all of these are, you know, famous PhD, you know, um, uh, professors, they are top of their field, they have all the credentials that you would expect from, you know, leading scientists, yet they are against Darwinism, they are against neo-Darwinism. Therefore, evolution is a theory in crisis, and we don't need to turn this into a worry anymore and as a result of that uh, people you know um get fictitious on on social media now what i would like to do is clarify this misconception from the very beginning because i've actually contacted these people personally i've sent them emails and asked them what exactly is your position because uh -huh. people are saying that you don't believe in evolution anymore so yeah. this is the um the website the third way and this is what I'm referring to here. So if you click on the third way, if you search for third way on Google, you'll find their website. Okay. Now, here is an email. This is a, a you know a sample email, but I sent the same thing by just changing the name to all of the professors I just uh, listed out earlier. Hello, dear Professor Shapiro. I hope you're well. My name is Shweb, and I research in the intersection of science and religion. I recently published a book on Islam and Islamic evolution. I recently came across uh, videos by creationists in which your name, along with others, was mentioned a lot. Creationists use your name and works to promote the idea that new Darwinism, which they equate to evolution, is a theory in crisis and therefore is false. However, when I went through your work, it seems you're questioning the mechanics of new Darwinism, not common ancestry. So are you still an evolutionist, just not a new Darwinist? Am I correct in understanding your position? Regards, Shweb. And I sent this email to all five people, well, to all four people. I'll explain why four, not five. Uh, it's because uh, the fifth person, um, Lynn, the, uh, Professor Lynn, uh, passed away, yeah, she passed yeah. away, yeah. She passed mm -hmm. away in 2011. So this is the response that I got. Shweb, you are correct. My position is that evolution by descent with modification is true. But the modifications do not occur randomly and gradually as proposed by the modern synthesis, i.e. Neo-Darwinism. Creationism and intelligent design are not scientific because they invoke supernatural interventions to explain the origins of biological complexity, while science is limited to natural explanations. Attached is a paper in press that lays the position out in detail. Please confirm receipt. Best wishes, James Shapiro. And he's written a book on this subject matter, and that's the book there uh, on the bottom right corner. <clears throat> so you can clearly see that James Shapiro is not denying that evolution occurred. What he is simply intending is that the mechanics of neo-Darwinism he doesn't agree with. That's all he's saying. And the same, and you will see the same line of responses with others. This is Professor Dennis Noble, right? He says, 
Dear Schwab, yes, you have understood correctly. I am questioning the biological processes that neo-Darwinists think, neo think are completely sufficient to explain evolution. I am also saying that some of the bases of neo-Darwinism are factually incorrect, and my work can be found here. So you see, again, the same response is happening. They're, they are evolutionists, they're just not agreeing with the mechanisms of neo-Darwinism. So can, can, can we, sorry to interrupt, can we just go back to that? I just want to note here, Professor Dennis Noble says, in my book, Dance to the Tune of Life, I also explain why I don't go along with the militant atheists like Dawkins and Coyne, who yeah. use neo-Darwinist interpretations of evolution to attack religion. Mm -hmm. I am agnostic. Um, so it, was it, isn't this chap, wasn't he the supervisor of Richard Dawkins at Oxford uh, originally? Um, so I'm not sure about those details. Uh, but anyway, it's interesting that he distances himself quite quite clearly there from uh, atheist scientists who, who use their science, so to speak, to attack religion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, very clearly put. This is Professor Eve Jablonka. Eva Jablonka. She wrote Evolution in Four Dimensions. Um, and this is what she says. <laughs> Just Dear Swabe, I'm an evolutionary biologist and a great admirer of Darwin. These creationists are shameless manipulators and liars, or idiots, or both. You understand my position perfectly. All the best. Okay. Eva. Very nuanced uh, response there. <laughs> no, no. I asked her, I, I sent her an email, do you want to mince your words a little bit? She's like, nope, because I'm basically she, sh she was frustrated that her work is being used to. Uh. To articulate, because it's, I'm assuming yeah, this is not the first time you've heard of she, she really wants to make it clear yeah, that she's yeah. on their side. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So, and then uh, now, uh, Professor uh, Masatoshi, he's, if, uh, if my calculations are correct, he's around 80 to 90 years old at the moment. So I didn't expect him to respond to me. But well, if, he, if he's Japanese, that probably he's still quite a young man by Japanese days. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, of course, I mean, like, I, whenever I mean, when I, when I sent these emails, I was gambling. I, I never expected a response, but the fact that three of them responded, I mean, I'm oh, more than happy with that. But uh, Professor Mas uh, Professor Masatoshi, he has written a whole book on evolution, explaining yeah. that he just disagrees with the mechanisms of New Darwin's, and he actually articulates his own position in this material. So again. It is not that evolution has not occurred, it's that they're disagreeing with the mechanisms of neo-Darwinism. And finally, Professor um, uh, uh, Lynn Margulis, this is, a, this is actually a, an article in which she was interviewed, uh, recorded on Discover Magazine. And it was published, I think, just a couple of months before she died. Uh, and there were a couple, and this, you know, this article has you know, a, a, several questions that was, that, were, that was asked of her. And the black ones, so the, so the bold ones are the questions. And then the non-bold are the, are the responses. So um, if you can read the first one, it says, most scientists say there is no controversy over evolution. Would you disagree? Why do you disagree? She says, all scientists agree that evolution has occurred. So common ancestry is true. That all life comes from common ancestry. That there has been extension and that new taxa, new biological groups have arisen. The question is, is natural selection enough to explain evolution? Is it the driver of evolution? And then if you follow so the next one. Selection, so by, nat by natural selection, she, she means a la Darwin. Is that right? That's it, yeah. That's yeah it. Because, These people yeah. are questioning the new Darwinist um, rendition of evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And do, you don't believe that natural selection is the answer? This is the issue I have with new Darwinists. They teach that what is generating novelty is the accumulation of random mutations in DNA in a direction set by natural selection. If you want bigger ebbs, you, you keep selecting the hens that are laying the biggest ends, uh, hens, and you keep and you get bigger and bigger eggs. But you also get hens with defective feathers and wobbly legs. Natural selection eliminates and maybe maintains, but it doesn't create. So then Sorry. it was asked of her, did Mendel miss something? Was Darwin wrong? I'd say both are incomplete, right? So I don't want to go to the rest of the answer. I mean, people can read that at another time. But the idea here is that all of these scholars, you know, who, were who are or were leaders in their fields are pretty much articulating that they don't have a problem with evolution in terms of common ancestry. What they simply have a problem with is the mechanisms of evolution. And that is why this paper is a very important paper that appeared in Nature. The, the, the headlines say, does evolutionary theory need a rethink? Now, people read just the headlines and think, whoa, evolution is a theory in crisis. But if you read the subtitle very carefully, researchers are divided over what processes 
should be considered fundamental. And this is where you see the split between this new movement called the extended evolutionary synthesis or the third way, and then your traditional new Darwinists. That's what this paper is about. It articulates both opinions. But none of them, no matter which side you're on, neither of them reject common ancestry. Yeah. So my take home message from all of this is evolutionary balls agree that evolution has occurred, but they disagree over the mechanics. And that is fine. In science, you have no, there, it's obvious that you're going to have disagreements, just like every human activity. We have differences of opinions in religion, we have different opinions in science, but the core features are maintained. The core features are maintained. So that is something I wanted to clarify before okay. I go to the next day. So yeah, do you, did you want to ask anything? Oh, no, no, uh, all clear so far. I'll hold my fire on this until later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. So now I'd like to articulate my approach when it, mm. when, it, when it comes to now addressing the interface of Islam and evolution. So people can, you know, go at it in multiple ways. So I've highlighted two there. People, some people say, let me first evaluate evolution on its own merit. So I will evaluate the science of evolution. And the moment I find holes in it, I don't need to worry about it because it has holes and I don't believe it's a solid theory. Therefore, it's not an issue that I need to worry about anymore. And that's fine. If that's your methodology, no problem. Um, the other, uh, another approach is you go to the theological style, right? So what extent can you... Um, um, uh, engage in, com in, in, in terms of theological nuances. Is there any space for evolution in there? Now, my approach is more of the second kind. What I simply do is, let me take evolution as a given. So I'm not going to question evolution. I'm going to say it's true as is. All right, let's say it's true as is. If that's the case, how far can we theologically embrace evolution assuming neo-Darwinian evolution is true? So I'm not even going to the extended evolution synthesis. I'm saying if neo-Darwinism is true, how much of it can I embrace as a Muslim? And so, um, uh, there are two questions that I need to address to be able to uh, uh, satisfy my theological um, uh, satisfaction, right? And those two are, one, can God do a process like what, what New Darwin says? Because people have a problem with natural selection and people have a problem with their imitation. God can do things by randomness. That makes for a very... I mean, it, 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 it's a vulgar to say this, but they think it's a stupid God. But that's, that's not, but, but that's what how people think when they think of randomness, right? Mm -hmm. The second question is, does this theory conflict with anything in my scripture? If both of these two filter tests are passed, this theory is fine. That's it. If these two th th questions are not passed, then something has to change from the science. But these are the, these are the two filters that I need to engage to see whether it is compatible with Islam or not. Which is why I personally believe that this issue must be addressed from a theological angle. Yeah. Not from a scientific angle, it has to be a theological issue, uh, concern. Which is why I make my presumptions very clear. I come at this conversation as a Sunni Muslim. That means I have certain presumptions about the nature of God, the nature of creation, and the, uh, the, the nature of that interaction between God and creation. Um, and I adopt scripture with a particular mindset. And I make those presumptions crystal clear in my book. I'm not hiding behind anything. I, I know, make it. Yeah, you I do, make it very, very I notice that it's very, very clear your your assumptions, presuppositions, and so on in the book. So that's commendable. But we're we're not being covertly influenced by a set of assumptions. You're very open yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. So I make it crystal clear. So w my first response is uh, when I w whenever I speak to people when it comes to Islam and evolution, my first question to them is which theological school are you coming from? Because if I can understand that, then I can kind of guess how you're going to interpret X Y Z theory. Um, so if you're Shi'i and you adopt a certain metaphysical baggage, that's fine. That's, that's your position there. If you're Sunni, which of the camps do you follow? Now, within Sunni school, there are three schools that come under this narrative. Ash'arism, Maturidism, and the Salafi or Athri school, whatever have you. They have their respective differences, some major, some minor issues. I am not going into this conversation with those polemical differences on board. I don't engage with those differences. I simply say, the Ash'ari theology is what I'm adopting through the lens of Imam al-Ghazali, hence the subtitle, al-Ghazali and the modern evolution paradigm. So that is the approach that I'm taking. And I hope that people can see that if you, even if you disagree with the Ash'ari approach, as long as you understand this is a valid Sunni model, 
this is the the conclusion that i'm going to be arriving at through this framework yep okay we're good to go that's fine so far cool okay right so now now let me are you know um express the the four positions that i carved out while i was um diving through the literature so in my opinion uh, this is the best way to kind of differentiate the various positions that are out there and it all has to do with what people believe is or isn't part of common ancestry okay so i, I there are four positions here creationism human exceptionalism adamic exceptionalism and no exceptions so i'm going to explain creationism and no exceptions first because they're the easiest then i'll get to the positions in between creationism is simply the antithesis of evolution it simply says that god created everything instantaneously so there is no like biological connection with us and monkeys or us and plants or whatever have you everything is distinctively created by god and directly created by god no question end of that's it right now i just want to make a, a point here because i think people need to be aware of this nuance creationism has a broad meaning and it has a narrow meaning broadly creationism means that god created the world in that case i'm a creationist in that case i'm a creationist yeah, that's, so that's really behind that because uh, this word creationist is banded around it always struck me that every believer in god by definition is a creationist exactly and if, exactly and if you're a theist, you know you have this kind of remote deity who just created the universe and let the universe get on with it but if you're from the abrahamic faith you've got to be a creationist because you believe god not only created the universe but yeah. was involved in uh creating everything literally everything including ourselves so we're all creationists <laughs> but yeah, exactly. that's the broader definition but the narrow one you, you're positing says no 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 uh, god created everything that we see distinctively supernaturally miraculously as it is without any macro evolution which also could be a god guided process of course but mm -hmm. but that is not involved at all so you, exactly you, so you, you mean in this restricted narrow sense of a supernatural miraculous creation of every insect every monkey every yeah. dinosaur forever okay. yeah 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 right. that, that, that's exactly it and ironically the person who stresses on this distinction is an atheist michael ruse he makes it he he tries to make it clear for people to make sure they understand this that creationism the big creationism is applicable to everyone anyone yeah. who believes in god but the yeah. narrow definition of creationism is not necessarily applicable to everyone. so you have no. to be careful that when we're talking about evolution we mean specifically that god as you said supernaturally created everything distinctively without macro evolution taking place right so this is one position and there are many people behind this uh position so you can find people like zakir naik harun yahya and a few others again these people are uh, are mentioned in my book i don't need to go into the details but just understand that this is a fundamental rejection of common ancestry it's the antithesis of common ancestry on the opposing side we have the no exceptions camp so these are a group of muslims who believe that evolution in its entirety can be accepted in the islamic framework in its entirety so whatever evolution says yep we can embrace it we can accept it and people in this camp have no problem saying uh at least most most people they have no problem saying that adam and eve were not miraculous creations and they had a mother and father they 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 can they will go to that extent so so we have creationism that everything is you know directly created by god and then we have the no exceptions camp that everything can be plugged in into the process of evolution including adam and eve so far is that okay paul yeah yeah so far so clear great so now let's move on to the positions in between now the second position here is human exceptionalism and mm -hmm. the name is self evident and it's very clear to understand what it means but mm -hmm. is this idea that every single entity every single entity out there is created by evolution no problem we can accept that however um humans are excluded from the process and this position maintains that adam and eve are the first human beings and they were miraculous creations and everything that therefore that springs forth is excluded from the process of evolution so humanity is excluded from the process of evolution because adam and eve themselves were miraculous creations and this i show in a diagram here so if you see this diagram this is just you know you know the branching process of evolution and i just show three different timelines so the left one is over a span of 60 million years uh, in the, the past 60 million years that is the middle one is over a span of 7 million years it shows all the hominids uh in in the process and then finally the third one is uh, over the past 2 million years and you can see very clearly that you know i mean this is just a reconstruction i'm not saying these are absolute details but here we see a bunch of you know 
hominins coming out, sprouting out, Neanderthals, Denisovans, whatever have you. And Adam is a miraculous creation identified by a white dot. And that indicates that he has no preceding biological lineage. He is a miraculous creation. And that's where Homo oh, sapiens yeah. kick off. Can I just ask a clarification question here? So in the human exceptionalism uh, field there, what age, what time span are we looking at then for the existence of Homo sapiens going back to Adam? Is it a hundred thousand years, a million years? What, what's the time scale? So in, 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 in Sunni Islam, there is no scriptural indication of when Adam was created. We have no, we have no constraint about 7,000 years. Anything that indicates that is from biblical literature, and that is called Isra'iliyat. These hadith are Isra'iliyat which are not considered valid or even theologically binding hadith. Okay. So um, we, there's no um, indication of when he existed, according to some Islam. So what's the best guess? Uh, do, do we have a best guess? I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of years or? I mean, uh, we, we, literally no guess. We, we, we don't have anything concrete. However, that has not stopped people from speculating. So there is a, uh, a, a professor, uh, sorry, uh, yes, a professor from Malaysia called Sayyid Naqtab al -Apas. He has written a book called The Justice of Man, um, and I forgot wh who the publisher is, but in that book, in Justice of Man, he kind of does the, you know, the patriarchal thing, going through the patriarchs and trying to establish right. lineages. And he estimates, if I remember correctly, Adam was created around 7,600 years ago. Hmm. This is his guess. Okay. Now, whether he says that, that that is a theologically binding guess or not, I, 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 I don't remember, but he did speculate about that. He did, he did come around the okay. conclusion. So, okay. Now, so, so this camp makes it very clear. Now, how do these people reconcile Islam with evolution? They'll just simply say, well, uh, so Yasir Qadi, this is his position, for instance. He'll say that from a scientific angle, from a scientific rubric, which does not permit miracles under its you know, umbrella, we can see a perfect seamless continuation, no problem. But from a theological angle, we know that Adam was created so, uh, miraculously. Now, how, do you, how does he reconcile? He simply says, when Adam was created, whenever evolution was expecting to pop forth a human-like entity, Adam came in with all the right genetic physiological data, and therefore it seems like a perfect continuation. And there's no problem with that. And that's how he comes to reconcile. The, well, the, the, I'll give you, there is a problem in terms of, of the alleged divine deception, because here you have a being which has all the uh, appearances of having uh, being biologically connected with the predecessors, but in fact not. So it, it's the appearance is given, but the reality is the opposite. In fact, it's a new creation, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. So, so he, he, he actually tackles that in his paper. He says that if you, if you are bringing forth the, the problem of divine deception, that is no longer a scientific argument. So that is outside of the remit to begin with. So it, will, it, it can only be responded in the theological plane. Whereas yeah. if you're entertaining a theological plane, then that's a different story what the science is saying. But in his response is, yeah, God can do that if he wanted to. There's no problem from our cool. from our He can do it if he wants to, yeah. No, that's, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, any questions about human exception, Paul? Or can no, I move no, on no, to uh, it? I'm still holding my fire. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so the next, the third position, and this is the, I, the more recent position that has come to the scene, mm. is Adamic exceptionism. Now, this is a term that I have given uh, to... Uh, uh, a position identified by David Solomon Gelato. Now, to explain this position, I just need to kind of go over two basic principles. Once these are understood, then we can move on to the position itself. So, the first thing is, is this idea of tawakkuf, which is suspending judgment. Hmm. And it's very simple terms. In, when you are making a claim about theology, particularly about things that God has done or has not done in the past, you need very clear scriptural references. Very clear scripture. Yeah. If there's nothing in scripture, you cannot then turn it into a religious matter, let alone a theological matter, right? So, for this, for for example, um, uh, Paul, let me ask you. Let me let me see if you if you know the question, if you know the answer to this question. Do are Muslims obligated to believe in the periodic table? Uh, they're not obligated theologically. No. Yeah, they're not. Are they obligated to deny the periodic table? Not theologically, no. Yes, yeah. Now, if the periodic table was mentioned in the Quran, it would be an article of faith. It would absolutely and, uh, then be an article of faith. Yeah. Then, then we are, uh, that's it. So if scripture mentions nothing, then you cannot make it into a point of theology and you no. cannot make it a religious contention. So that's the waqaf. That's what we mean in the theological sense. The waqaf has a slightly different meaning in the, in the legal sense, but this is what means in the theological space. Now, the second position is, uh, the second idea is that the Quran is highlighting a theological conception of the human being. Mm. 
But when scientists are looking at human beings, they are looking at it through a biological lens, right? Mm -hmm. And this, uh, these two categories may not necessarily be the same. Mm -hmm. They may or may not be the same. That's the thing. Now, why is this important? Let me explain. So we know from the Quran, Allah, God refers to uh, human beings as insan, as bashar, as Benu Adam, right? The kids of Adam and, you know, in uh, the terms of insan and bashar. That is crystal clear. No one can deny any of those categories in scripture, okay? Now, there's also a scientific definition, which is um, a human is a bipedal hominin characterized by whatever vertical height, etc., etc. And there's a bunch of biological properties there. Now, the question is, are these two the same? And, the, and the, 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 I mean, the honest answer here is, we don't know. We don't know. There might have been human beings that, are, that, can, that, that just start off with Adam and Eve, but there might have been human beings that were coexisting or pre-existing uh, than Adam and Eve. So this is the, the, the point here. Now, from a theological angle, Adam and his descendants are a theological certainty. But there is nothing in the Quran about what coexisted with Adam. Could there have been other human beings or human-like beings that were created through evolutionary processes? We don't know. We have no clue. That is why we do tawaqqaf on these other potentially human beings that could have existed. It is a reality that could have been. It is also a reality that could not have been. We do not have a scriptural basis to affirm either position. And that is why we maintain tawaqqaf. Mm -hmm. is, is that okay so far, Paul? Yeah, I just want to introduce, uh, just for the sake of completeness, a couple of quotes from the Quran. Um, uh, for actually, that you cite in your book, page 96, uh, Islamic Perspectives on Evolution. Um, you say there are verses in the Quran which make it apparent that hum humanity can be traced down to a single couple, i.e. Adam and Eve. And you create a quote, Quran chapter 4, verse 1. People, yeah. be mindful of your Lord, who created you from a single soul, and from it created its mate, and from the pair of them spread countless men and women far and wide. Be mindful of God and so on. And then another uh, verse uh, in chapter 49, verse 13, which reads, People, we created you all from a single man and a single woman and made you into races and tribes so that you should recognize one another. Uh, in God's eyes, the most honored of you are the ones most mindful of him. God is all knowing, all aware. So that strikes me uh, as absolute rock bottom certainty that God created uh, a single pair um, historically. So that's a theological statement about an actual event in our space time mm -hmm. continuum. And, and that would appear to limit the, the, the options in terms of, you know, can we affirm A, B, C or D as, as you're outlining it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in light of those positions, that's why um, I would say this for both Sunnis and Shi'is, I would say I, I can confidently say for both camps, hmm. it's very hard to deny Adam and Eve as historical figures. It's very hard. They are historical realities. They are historical agents. Uh, and, and that is why they, I think both maintain that these are real people that existed. And all of us can be traced back to them. But just also for the sake of completion, you, you look at uh, other verses, but I, I won't quote uh, in the Quran to do with animal species, uh, plants and so on. Uh, and um, you conclude, and I won't go into this in detail, but the, the, these are not incompatible with macro evolution, uh, the, the, these verses. Uh, but the uh, you, they, but you do talk about Adamic exceptionalism, uh, where it is clear for various reasons in the scriptures that Adam and Eve were created um, yeah. distinctly. And there's actually one of my favorite uh, verses um, in the Quran, I'll just get it up here, um, where you talk about uh, Jesus or Isa, peace mm -hmm. be upon him. Um, and you say one key verse makes interpreting Adam having parents, if you were so inclined to think that, difficult is the following verse, uh, Quran verse 359. In God's eyes, Jesus is just like Adam. He created him from dust, said to him, be, and he was. And you say this verse's context gives uh, an apparent reading that Adam was created without any parents. And mm -hmm. you put um, a very interesting hadith, which I, I won't uh, mention, but um, it's uh, to do with uh, two monks uh, coming to the prophet. Uh, and uh, but the context seems to make it quite clear um, that Jesus was born miraculously without a father. 
Um, and Adam, though, was born miraculously without a father or a mother. And that's kind of the, the, the context of all this. So it's kind of reinforcing the point um, that, that you're making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, anything else, Paul, or? No, oh, no, that's fine. That's all for now. <laughs> Great, okay. So um, just, again, to make it clear, um, in, in Sunni Islam, it's crystal clear that Adam and Eve were created miraculously, and all of us can be traced down to the two of them. There, there's no denying any of that. However, the Quran is silent. It mentions nothing about what coexisted at the time. There could or could not have been similar human beings or hominins or biologically identical um, things that with which um, humans could have re, re, you know uh, reproduced or recreated with. So let me make this clear in in in, in a visual format. From Islamic scripture, we have Adam and Eve, and this is not as an insult. I'm just representing a male and a female figure. And then we have, you know, a representation of humanity coming forth, right? So now entities posited by evolutionary biology. Now, the reason why um, it's difficult uh, for, for, for there to be only two people to come up with a whole population is because of something called genetic bottleneck. Um, genetic bottleneck suggests that if you have only two people or two two members of a species, they because the genetic diversity is so low that when they have kids and you know through ancestral relationships, there will be so many diseases that eventually they'll die out. So um, that's why this is a scientific issue to some degree. Now, so let's just say, assuming that there were other human beings with that existed, coexisted at the time and added them. Let's just say if, if, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. And let's just say they intermarry. Now, does the Quran reject that? No, it doesn't. The Quran is completely silent about what coexisted at the time in Adam and Eve. So it is very possible that there were human-like entities through which um, Adam's descendants may have intermingled with. It is a very, it, it's possible. It's not, we're not saying that it occurred. It's saying that it's possible. It is compatible with scripture. That okay. option is compatible. So now uh, somebody uh, very nicely, uh, I forgot the name of the individual, but he very nicely drew this diagram for me. Um, I, I, he did a very good job. So these are all the other hominins that you saw in the previous uh, phylogenetic uh, trees. And so you can see here, Adam and Eve are at the top, right? In the middle of the page. And then you, you see them, you know, uh, springing up. And then all that's suggesting that there could have been some of these hominins that interact with humans. And therefore we have some of those genes in us, which is what we see scientifically. That some oh, of you mean, beings, people like Neanderthals. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you go towards Europe, you you see uh, a heavier presence of Neanderthal genes. Mm -hmm. If you go towards um, East Asia, like literally East Asia, we're talking about Indonesia, Japan, those areas. You see heavier presence of Denisovan genes. Um, so we have genes that are isolated from one another. So which okay. which suggests which is that you know that they may have intermarried or whatever have you. Now, th someone may say it's possible that those themselves are still the kids of Adam, that those are descendants of Adam. That's fine. None of that is being yeah, denied. It always struck me as, I don't know why the Andrews are seen as separate species, like, you know, cats and dogs. They always strike me as very hu humanoid, but I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, I don't know yeah, so, uh, that rabbit hole, by the way. I'm just saying. Sure, 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 sure. Why, sure. why are they humans? I mean, they, they bury their dead. They, yeah, they bred with humans, so-called yep. humans. So, why aren't they just a, a variant? Um, yeah, but anyway, that's a different subject. Yeah, we, we, we can entertain that later on. But uh, now I wanted to clarify one misconception because people have you know uh, brought this up. So I just wanted to make sure this is clear. Some people think that Adamic exceptionalism permits this idea that there are human beings today that do not trace themselves back to Adam and Eve. Oh, so see. they think of an image like this. Adamic exceptionalism fundamentally denies this. Whatever those co- you know, Adamic entities were or pre-Adamic entities were, they must have died off for this thesis to have been true. They okay. must have so died we, off. Okay, so we yeah. only, we, we only got human beings, descendants of Adam and Eve, on the planet today, as far as we're yes. concerned. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, some of them can trace their lineage back to these other entities. There's no problem with that, but they are still kids of Adam. Just, now, let, let's say, for the sake of the example, let's say aliens existed, and mm. uh, it is now go, imagine a world where God created aliens with which we can reproduce with. Now, if I reproduced with an alien, does that mean I'm no longer a children of Adam, a child of Adam? Of course I am. My lineage still goes back to Adam. The same way here, just because if, if interbreeding did take place, your lineage is not lost to Adam. And that's the key point here. Right. So, um, so I wanted to make that clear. Now, to sum it up, was Adam created miraculously? Yes. Was Eve created miraculously? Yes. Do all of us uh, have a lineage that traced back to Adam and Eve? Yes. Did Adam's descendants 
intermingle with other humans, uh, sorry, humans, hominins at some point. So you're saying that this is a responsible theological um, response to this whole question of Islam and evolution, taking seriously the scriptural evidence for um, uh, Adam and Eve being a special yeah. creation. And this is this is your view as well, I take it, is it? Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm happy uh, considering it's a valid option. So as, as I mentioned to you, if evolution is false, I have no problem calling myself a creationist. I believe that evolution does have, have weight behind it. So therefore, I'm happy being a human exceptionist or an Adamic exceptionist. For me, it's it's okay. I mean, like, okay. I, I'm so, uh, I, I kept my powder dry. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm just going to um, uh, bring up um, some views. Uh, Oh, before you do, can I just sum it up with this visual summary? Because oh, I, I, I need to uh, yeah, derail you. Carry on. Yes. Yeah. So um, previously, when I showed you the same image, I showed you a white dot where Adam was disconnected from the rest of the uh, right. from the proceeding. Yeah. Here, because we don't know when Adam existed, right? He could have been before Hyder began this, so he could have been the father of H Denisovans. He could have been the father of Neanderthals. You can see that here that he could have been the father of those right, right we yeah. don't know when he existed i'm glad you, I'm glad you put that as a possibility that's good <laughs> yeah so yeah. so so none of that is is denied by by adamic exceptionism but because yeah. we don't know how you load the word insan and bashar with these biological yeah. categories these yeah. pos these possibilities are open they're up in the air mm. and that's why we say god knows best allahu alam indeed indeed yeah, no, yeah. now you can uh, now you can go ahead yeah we, yeah. yeah, so I'm looking really um, at uh, some comments by Dr. Shabir Akhtar, who I had the privilege of interviewing on my channel, actually. He's an academic at the University of Oxford. He's a, a Muslim philosopher. Uh, you can look him up on Wikipedia. And uh, he's written um, uh, a book, actually, I'm sorry, it's an amazing book, Islam and the Secular Mind, a Philosophy of Islam by uh, Shabir Akhtar, as I say. And um, he makes some very bold statements, which um, I, I quite like uh, in his book. Um, and I'll just read you what he says. And he's he's basically saying the Quranic, like the biblical worldview, conflicts with uh, the scientific perspective. OK, but but in a particular way. And I'll just read you what he says. The Quranic, like the biblical worldview, conflicts with the scientific perspective, which assumes that the cosmos is a self-contained set of patterned empirical sequences intelligible to us in terms of natural causality. The spatial temporal continuum is subject to discoverable lawful regularity. So that's the kind of the scientific worldview. But he says within science, nature remains autonomous and self-sustaining. Islam, however, posits an additional supernatural realm and denies the autonomy of nature. It denies the autonomy of nature. And he quotes here 35, Quran 3541 in the Abdul um, Halim translation reads, God keeps the heavens and earth from vanishing. If they did vanish, no one else could stop them. God is most forbearing, most forgiving. So God keeps the heaven and earth from, from vanishing. Then he goes on directly, actively and continuously. God sustains the world after creating it. He prevents the lowest heaven, our sky, from collapsing on sinful humanity. That's a reference to Quran 2265. Arranges the clouds, directs the winds that give rain and revive the dead earth. Quran 35, 9 holds the birds poised in mid air, mid air Quran 67 19 and keeps the two seas separate Quran 25 53 and then this is actually it's a great bit of rhetoric here and I, I really like this next bit this is the last bit I'm going to read the Quranic cosmology presupposes continuous interaction between the natural causal world and the supernatural realm of occult causality a cult meaning secret. We don't observe the causality. That's what the Quran presupposes, he says. Then he says, supernatural agents routinely act within and interpenetrate the natural world of empirical causality. He says, God is active. He shapes the embryo in the womb as he pleases, Quran 3 6. And then he says, in the spiritual interaction between the two worlds, Human petition, prayer, piety, pure speech, and good deeds ascends to the unseen world. Quran twenty two thirty seven. This picture, he says, is incompatible with empirical science. 
modern scientists feel obliged to reject on principle the possible existence of God, the devil, indeed all spirits, including those of the departed dead, the jinn, demons, angels, and other immaterial or incorporeal entities lacking space time coordinates. End quote. I mean, it's <laughs> correct. I, I like the way he juxtaposes, you know, demons, angels, uh, lacking space time coordinates. You know, uh, absolutely right. Now, I mean, to be fair, he's not making uh, an obscur obscurantist or a creationist uh, point in the narrow sense of denying macroevolution. But what he's asserting here is the theological, the metaphysical. So you've got the physical and the metaphysical that goes beyond the physical. He's asserting the reality of the metaphysical world where God exists and the interpenetrability of these dimensions. I think he does that beautifully. And of course, the Bible is the same, both the Jewish Bible and the New Testament. And um, so he says in that sense, there is a conflict uh, with the scientific perspective. Well, what do you say to that? Right. So first, I want to say, uh, you know how you went physical, metaphysical. There's a very good friend of mine, yeah. um, Sheikh Han. He says that all the time because I stress those distinctions all the time. And you kind of reminded me of him when you, when you went like that. So, <laughs> so but yeah, um, I think uh, uh, Professor Akhtar, I think he's made a very good point. Uh, and I think if he's criticizing anything, it is this naturalistic metaphysics that has become predominant in the scientific framework. Um, now, scientists, scientists occupy a range of ideas. Metaphysics is no, they're, they're not metaphysically isolated individuals. They right. occupy some kind of metaphysics. Now, there's no denying that naturalism reigns the day in most people's minds, right? However, we also have scientists who are religious folks. So just because there's a scientific theory that can be couched in the naturalistic framework, mm -hmm. it, it also means that that same theory can be couched in a theistic framework. Both are possible. What your metaphysical contentions are don't necessarily have to become the staple diet for your scientific ideas. They're just, they, that's, that's the reason why they're called metaphysics. They're beyond the physical categories. Mm -hmm. So if people ask me, well, how can you be a Muslim and an evolutionist um, or doesn't that entail naturalism or atheism? Like, no, because God, how, he, may, he may create the world in any shape or form as he sees fit. So if, it is, if, if you believe in a God that is omniscient, omnipotent, and can do anything, he can create a revolution. There's no problem with that whatsoever, right? So it, we have to be very careful but when we are saying that this is atheistic or naturalistic, we are not confusing the interpretation of an atheist of the science versus the science itself. These are two different things. I can put the, the, I can put a, the theory of electrons and the theory of atoms in an atheistic framework or the theistic framework. The only difference is that there is this interpenetrative causation. Although, although I think theoretically you're right, of course. Uh, the problem is that in terms of the PR, the propaganda war, if, a na if a naturalism, anti-theistic naturalism is um you know um synthesized with science which it certainly is in some scientists uh explanation of of, of their work richard dawkins famously um that can create a, a perceived problem for uh people of, of the abrahamic faiths because they, they got then deal with this individual who is qualified clearly in some ways to speak authoritatively but is extending his uh, purview uh, illegitimately into metaphysical realms, which his science doesn't license him to do, but he chooses to do it anyway, thus creating a public relations problem for uh, for believers in general. Mm -hmm. So, uh, although the theoretical distinctions there in practice, uh, in in the the way we see these things operating in the world, there is still a problem, is there not? Yeah, I mean, of, of I can't speak for how scientists practice their their faith in in their in their laboratories. I can't speak to all of that. But what I can definitely say is that um, you have some scientists who kind of um, don't make a differentiation. Sometimes do make a differentiation. They're reactive about it. Um, yeah. But I think what it comes down to simply is this idea that as long as you believe that your presumption uh, about the world and its nature is kept intact. I don't think scientists should have a worry um, because I, I personally believe that metaphysics should not necessarily impinge on your scientific activity. In fact, in my opinion, 
uh, at least the kind of God that I believe in, I believe that the scientific activity of an atheist and a theist is virtually indistinguishable. Perhaps, uh, maybe not on the ethical side of things, and maybe if you believe in an immaterial soul, you may not be able to access certain insights. But apart from those two, I think there's a lot of overlap between the two. That is why you can have theists and atheists reaching the same conclusions in science. Mm. I, 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 st I still feel slightly uh, uneasy, although I accept the, the theoretical point you're, you're making. I mean, I, I do a series of, of um, uh, posts called uh, No Design with a little figure looking, eyes looking up. It's meant to be an anti-atheist anti point. But okay, we're, we're, so many people, when, they, when, they, when, they, when, when you put up my, my photo that you're speaking with me, many people were commenting No Design. And I'm like, what is No Design? I don't know what that label is. Now this makes yeah, sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little meme uh, I created. Uh, no, no design w with uh, eyes looking up. It, it, it's um, it, it is to uh, so I, I put some you know incredible pictures of of design in nature up for people just to to see because you know the Quran talks about the signs in nature, and it's a, it's a way of it's a, it's a ironic um, not not te not terribly hurtful dig at, at atheists who just deny design, but I, I mean it, it strikes me that w when I as a layman when I look at DNA, when I look at the biological machines we now know to exist in uh, the human cell, for example, uh, which you can actually observe them now. These are incredibly sophisticated pieces of machinery, um, which um, certainly the, the traditional Darwin, uh, Darwin explanation of natural selection simply couldn't cope with that because we're dealing here with very precise pieces of, of uh, engineering, let alone the macro level of the laws of physics, uh, the exquisite fine tuning there and the existence of the universe itself and so on and going on. Um, so uh, it, it seems to me that Muslims are right or people of faith are right to see design there because God made the world. But it seems that science in its methodology uh, at least in its methodology, denies design. Design. It, it just says no. It's not design. It's mm -hmm. a product of this macro process, which is not teleological. In other words, it doesn't have a trajectory. It doesn't have an end goal. There's no foresight. It seems in that theory. So there just seems to be a tension here. But when the believer is doing science, he's both saying or she is saying, "Yep, I can use Darwinian or neo-Darwinian explanations." but i also see design but they're not just different levels that they, they are speaking about the same thing design re refers to an actual designer who is designing dna or designing a biological machine we see in in cells for example mm -hmm. uh, how do we d d you know ignore the design explanation and yet affirm science but the design explanation is affirming something intrinsic to the phenomena being described do you see what i mean it, it seems to me that it's like an artificial distinction sure so um when we talk about intelligent design i, I would rather lump this conversation with that so that yeah. it, ma it makes more sense when we when we get to that point but i can definitely address your point about teleology purpose so yes. design um, has multiple aspects to it so complexity is a feature of design right or something that shows consistency or patterns is a sense of design Another aspect of design is intentionality. Can you see a purpose behind it? So these are three slightly different understandings of yeah. design, right? Yeah. I'm addressing the last point, the idea of purposefulness, right? Yeah. So from an Ash'ari standpoint, it's, it's very clear that God can design the world or, or God can organize the world where your purpose may or may not be apparent to you. So God could create us through a random-like process and your purpose does not need to be apparent to you through the natural world. In fact, the Ashara make it very clear that your purpose is only dictated by revelation. Anything outside of revelation is your whimsical opinion. So you can construe several speculations about why you were created by a God once you arrive at the, arrive at the designation. But in terms of what is your purpose, that can only be affirmed through revelation. So that's what they would say on this particular subject matter. I wasn't talking about the meaning and purpose in a human life. I was talking mm -hmm. about in biological systems like uh, biological machinery we see mm -hmm. in the cell. So it's not a question of do I understand the meaning of that. But the, 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 the Muslim view is, the Quranic view seems to be that these uh, mechanisms have intrinsic teleology. Tele mm -hmm. Sorry, what I mean by teleology, I think the Greek word telos means, uh, ancient Greek word means uh, end or something having a goal. So mm -hmm. telos, teleology. So it's a study of those things that have purpose and a goal like ends. Uh, Orientation, not, yeah. Uh, random. They have a trajectory which is meaningful. 
uh, and you know has there's foresight involved and it's moving towards a goal. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I, it, it just seems that science, uh, as perhaps in the West, uh, uh, denies teleology, uh, although it's there in Aristotle, but they seem to they, they rejected Aristotle's teleology. But theologically, teleology must exist because the Quran says endlessly that God created these things. These are signs, these are ayat. To use the word ayat, the same word for the Quran is used for these things we see in the universe, which indicate the creative uh, design like, sorry, the, the creative powers of God himself as creator. It just seems that I, I, I don't see the, the conceptual, uh, I, don't, I can't understand this holistically. It seems that science denies what the Quran affirms, and therefore there is really a conflict. Is there not? Okay, so uh, what you just said there, I addressed in, in the intelligent design part, what you just okay. said there. Right. And I think this, and, and to some degree, this also dovetails perfectly with what I want to say in this presentation slide. Uh, so, oh, oh, carry on. Yeah, okay, great. So um, now it comes to uh, addressing what is and isn't theologically valid according to the framework that I have uh, uh, adopted in my approach, which is the Ash'ari framework adopted by Imam Ghazali. Right uh, now, just to make it very clear, I have two questions here. One is it metaphysically possible, which is specifically what I mean by that is, can God do it? Yes or no? And the second question is, is it scripturally possible? I.e., is it compatible with scripture? So these are the two questions that I'm going to be addressing here. Now, the God of uh, Ash'ari theology pretty much stresses on God's omnipotence that God can do anything as long as, as long as it is logically possible. So as long as you're not arguing for a contradiction, uh, it's possible that God can manifest that choice if he wanted to do so. So can God create us to creationism, human exceptions, Adamic exceptions, or no exceptions? The answer is blatantly yes, for all possibilities. He can create us through a variety of different ways. And I think no one can, I mean, no one would argue against that. I think that's a very clear understanding that metaphysically, everything is possible. Now, to I'm going to entertain one contention that you may be entertaining or maybe some of your viewers might be entertaining paul and that is the idea of randomness right so randomness is a very loaded term um mm. and, and in fact in my book i actually have four philosophical concepts of randomness right and i say only one of them is actually in conflict with the theological model that i adopt yep. the rest of the three are absolutely fine now but just briefly speaking there's uh, an epistemic interpretation of randomness and then there's an ontological interpretation of randomness by epistemic i mean simply that it's due to my inability to gather the information right. so if i have a you know a coin toss if i know all the variables down to every detail i can predict exactly like a clockwork like like, like a clock machine when where it's going to land heads or tails that's because i have all the information mm -hmm. but of course as a limited human being I don't necessarily have every single detail down to the T. As a result, I may or may not guess that toss. I may get it right. I may not get it right. You don't know so enough. That, like, yeah, you don't know enough. That is an epistemic limitation on yeah. us. Yeah. Right? So when, we, when scientists are saying randomness, they could, it could be easily understood as an epistemic limitation. When a mutation occurs, it may be due to several causes, copying errors, x-rays, whatever have you. We just don't know when, how frequently occurred, because we're trying to interpret the past. So we don't necessarily have the full information. And that's fine. This is where probability and statistics comes into natural sciences. That's what, what, what this does. It is a kind of a, a way of explaining possibilities through a probabilistic framework. So that's, that's that. That's, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is ontological, where there might be physical gaps in nature. So there might be things in creation which do not have a physical cause. Miracles may be one of them, right? It's not necessarily a physical explanation for a miracle because it's directly something that God does that does not have a preceding physical cause. So, so and again, in, the, in the Quran example, obviously it would be, uh, would be Jesus' uh, uh, conception in the womb of Mary, yeah. miraculously. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. The virgin birth. It doesn't matter what sci scientists can't, adjudicate on that can't describe it or explain it because yeah, it is yeah, a yeah. outside the remit exactly outside it's the outside remit. The remit. yeah so um in, in those cases we can accept physical gaps in nature there's no problem with that 
The only kind of ch randoms that Muslims or uh, Ash'aris will not be able to accept is, a, is the strong interpretation of ontological randomness, where this is the idea that God is somehow a deist God or a limited God, like a kenotic model, where God limits himself to give autonomy to creation of sorts. This kind of God or this kind of interpretation of randomness just simply does not exist in the Muslim mindset. It does not exist. And unfortunately, people always resort to this kind of thinking um, when it comes to randomness, whereas randomness can be couched in other interpretations very clearly in the scientific image. Now, some atheists press on this interpretation because they want to kind of keep that divide between evolution and religion like Dawkins does. That's what his, his whole agenda is. But we needn't be uh, impressed by that or adopt that. As I said, science is, is just a methodology. And you can couch that methodology in an atheistic framework as well as a theistic framework, easily, right. in my opinion. Okay. So, um, the, the, yeah, the, the, um, anything else that you want to add to the poll? Or uh, no, or I'm not, I'll wait to the, 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 uh, the ID section before I go further, yeah. Great, okay. So, and now, finally, the second question is, what is scripturally possible or compatible? And in my estimations, and this is my humble opinion, creationism is compatible with the Qur'an. So evolutionists who are criticizing evolutionists saying you're getting, going against the Qur'an because you don't have evolution, you're, you're, you're putting a lot more in the Qur'an than what it says. If there is not enough information and, and, and there is ambiguity or silence in the Qur'an, you cannot criticize your fellow brothers or your sisters just because they adopt creationism. So that has to stop. By the same token, um, the reverse should be true as well. If you are an evolutionist, right? Human exceptionism and Adamic exceptionism are viable models. Theologically, both are fine at the end of the day. So, in, so gi given my analysis and my conclusions, whatever people believe about evolution now is a personal opinion. It cannot be a theological conflict. Now, some people still see it as a theological conflict, and that's fair enough. I'm, I'm more than happy to receive criticism, and then we can have that dialogue further. In fact, we're actually working on another monograph where we look at every single verse and every single hadith in detail to show right. the various possibilities that can coexist with those verses. That's and true. that will come out in a year or two. So that's a completely hermeneutic exercise, just that's to kind of um, appease to people's worries or contention about this verse or that verse. And that, yeah. that, that's a two-year project, inshallah. But, um, but, but I, I've made it very clear that um, these are the possibilities. The only thing that I think we, uh, that at least Sunni Islam will not be able to accept um, is this idea that Adam and Eve had parents. And that is because the scriptural indications are, you know, very, very, very apparent. Uh, and, and it's difficult to argue otherwise. Uh, now, this is not to say that people who adopt this position, you know, I would exclude them out of Islam. I can't say that. That's not my position to say so. But I'd say that that would be a huge theological disagreement when it comes to... Yeah. It, it, it would strike me that they were clearly disagreeing, basically, with the Quran. They would say, no, well, you say that you, the Quran says this, but well, it, was not, it wasn't right. God yeah. got it wrong. It would be impossible. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. But, but, but this, is, this is what I conclude in my book. Now we move on to your favorite subject, Paul, which is intelligent design. Right. Okay. So um, let me start off with explaining the background of intelligent design. Uh, so I'm actually working on a book right now on Islam and intelligent design, with, and hopefully it will come out with. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. I didn't know that. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I'm working on six books at the moment. Um, one of them is a textbook. One of them is intelligent design. One of them is a hermit. But yeah, we don't need to worry about six books. Yeah, six books. I find it difficult reading six books at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> writing six books at the same time. So, I, mean, so no, I mean, because it's all related and it all gets very interesting. So you get ideas and you kind of put them all into a melting pot and you get, you know, you can get very good uh, outputs like that. Um, but let me make it clear what intelligent design is. Yeah. Intelligent design is a very recent movement that started off in the 1980s in America, right? It doesn't have it, it, an origin back in the 17th century, unless you want to stretch the argument style. But as a movement, it is very distinctively a modern movement in the States. Now, it has many creationist historical antecedents, right? So if you look at the history of America, if you look at the history of creationism, Ronald Numbers has done a fantastic job. He's published several books in this area. He kind of walks you through from 1859 to the contemporary period about how many different creationist movements individuals came to the picture and then how intelligent design evolved out of that uh, framework. Now, um, so, so, so let's just make it clear. This is a movement that started off in the 1980s. Now, I just want to make sure this is clear from the beginning because people misunderstand when I criticize intelligent design. So I'm not a, let me make it uh, apparent, I'm not a fan of ID. 
In fact, I think ID should be gunned down from the Islamic framework. I, I think it should, Muslims should never adopt. That's my personal opinion, but I'll, I'll articulate why. Now, the name is very deceptive because when you criticize intelligent design, uh, people automatically think one of these three things or all of them together. People think that you're rejecting that God is intelligent or they're thinking that you're rejecting that God is a designer or they're thinking that you're rejecting the design inference of the Quran. That's what you're rejecting. I reject none of those. I want to make it clear. I reject none of those. But so when you... You do accept the third one, the design references in the Quran. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually have an article coming out with Zygon. Um, so, so I'm, I uh, guess, editing a special issue with Zygon, which is the world's top religion, uh, journal in science and religion. And it's, it's, uh, we had a conference on Islam and evolution. And I, I have a paper that I've co-written with Sheikh Hamza Karamali, who's a Kalam scholar. Uh, he's currently living in Turkey. And a PhD student from Cardiff University, Muhammad, Muhammad Khalili. The three of us sat down and wrote a paper on the design argument written from a Kalamic framework in terms of the Quran. And we make it very clear that from a Kalam perspective, critiquing ID does not equate to critiquing the Quran. Very clearly. We kind of yeah. show that very clearly. You reject the American movement, uh, start of the 1980s ID movement, but you do, to use the language in a different context, accept intelligent design. In I so accept there's design in the universe. I do not accept the propositional argument of intelligent design. Right, but you'll come to that in a second. Okay. Thank yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to make it clear that I am not rejecting any of these things because people misunderstand me uh, unless i make this apparent and clear from the beginning no, that's good you're making it clear yeah right okay so now id is um is a, is a very smart movement right now they make it very clear in their books i i, I think that when, particularly lay people when i speak to them about intelligent design i don't think that they've actually read the books to know enough what they're saying id is not um arguing against deep time so the first proposition that we're talking about ID is also not arguing necessarily against common ancestry. Michael Behe, for instance, he accepts common ancestry. Yeah. He accepts common ancestry. Many people get shocked when I say that, but he accepts common ancestry. What they are specifically arguing against is this idea that natural selection and random mutation are sufficient to explain certain biological complexities. This is their argument. They're specifically attacking the mechanisms the same way that we saw remember the debate between new darwinists and the extended evolution synthesis the same thing so uh, okay, can, can I that? Uh, in, in um stephen mayer um, he's probably the the high priest of uh, the id movement in america that's one way of putting it in yep. his recent book return of the god hypothesis just published this year uh he talks about three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe um this is not all to do with neo-darwinism this is to do with one of them is to do with the big bang uh, for example. Um, so this is not just focused on um, uh, neo-Darwinism. I just want to stress that. It's to do with the whole universe, the existence of the universe itself, the fine-tuning argument, uh, and so on and so forth, without going into his book, I mean. Right, yeah. So, um, uh, so, so, so intelligent design, in terms of the biological realm, they are specifically against the mechanism. That is their united front. Yeah. That natural selection and random mutation on their it's own yeah. Yeah, is insufficient. Yeah. As a result, so this is how their argument goes. Because um, you can explain biological complexities either through a designer or through a natural selection random mutation. Natural selection are insufficient. Therefore, a better explanation is a designer. And they make it clear that the designer can be anything. It can be aliens. It can be this or that. Blah, blah. Now, well, in the private world, the universe, this is only biological issues. By the way, when, when in, in Mayer's recent book, he's dealing with the existence of the universe itself and the Big Bang and and the fine tuning yeah. of the laws of physics. So yeah. that that's not it's not just about mechanisms. It's about the big picture too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a different story. Yeah, I'm I'm focusing on the biological realm, right? Okay. So. There are these biological complexities like your DNA, the eye, or whatever. And so yeah. therefore, a better uh, explanation is a design. So this is Michael Behe's example, the bacterial fl flagellum, right? So oh, yeah. this is a bacteria. There's a flagellum. Irreducible complexity, etc. Yeah. 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 So there's, it looks like a motor. So many parts need to come together. It is impossible yeah. this came by natural selection. Therefore, a designer did it. Or, or, or a better explanation is a designer did it, right? Now, for me... This is a problematic narrative. Now I give, I have a whole chapter in intelligent design where I completely articulate my opinions in there, right? But I'm going to summarize that here as best as I can. In Ash'ari theology, the fundamental axiom is contingency. Now any world that God creates, whether it's this world or another world, 
the foundation of that creation is that it is a contingent creation. And all contingencies go back to a necessary being, which is identified to be with God, right? So this is the key starting point. Now, that contingency can occupy very a variety of descriptions. It can be random, non-random. It could look designed. It could look very simple. It could be completely chaotic. So God could create a world in Ash'ari theology where there's no design. There's total chaos. That is completely valid from an Ash'ari theological framework. Absolutely valid. Because the foundational starting point is that there is a contingent entity going back to the necessary being. Now, because of this, because of this, whether the universe is designed or not makes no difference in, in terms of proving God's existence. So I don't need a designer or the, des or the intelligent design argument to substantiate God. All I need is contingency and that is sufficient for my purposes. Am I rejecting that the universe is designed? No, I never said that. The universe is clear design, there are patterns, there are structural um, uh, aspects of the universe. I don't deny any of that. But I'm saying that my faith in God does not resist, resist, uh, rest on design. It rests on the contingency argument. And this is a basic Kalam foundational principle, both in Ashari Kalam and Matthew Kalam. I understand. But doesn't the Quran, though, the Quran doesn't rest on the Kalam argument, does it? Or the argument contingency so much. It does rest on the ayat, this yeah. word signs, which is not just the Quranic verses, but the signs of the universe. It talks about the birds, the mountains, the water, the animals, the, the rain, um, yeah. and so on and so on. Is it not pointing to signs of intelligent design to use our jargon although it's not using that language but it's it's, it's saying that these are uh, evidences uh, these strong evidences for the existence and they're self-evident our fitra our, our innate nature can recognize these if we just open our eyes and see them so it's a question of just reflecting just yep. can't, can't you can't offer this, can't you see can't you observe this universe um yep. And so the, the stress is not so much on the contingency uh, point, but on the the design, to use modern jargon. Um, so it's not incidental whether or not it is designed. The Quran is saying it is designed and you can see it and you should see it because this th this leads to to God. Is right. That, so, that common? So, so, so none of that is being negated. The fact that there is design and you can infer from that design that there must be some kind of designer is never negated, right? But it works off the back of contingency. Now that argument, we articulate in the paper that I'm talking about, which will be published in a few months. So I'll, I'll, I'll just, you know, postpone that conversation when that article comes out, inshallah. Now, th so that's, that's more of a theological foundation that I'm, 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 I'm looking at it from. So for me, personally speaking, when people, because this is the thing, ID advocates themselves make it clear that ID is compatible with theism, atheism, and agnosticism. I'm talking about the biological argument. This is true. So, when they, they themselves make that claim, why do I bother with ID as a theological argument? I don't need to bother with that. I have, I have contingency. That is my theological argument against them. Now, as for the proposal itself, as for the proposal itself, that there's some things that are so biologically complex that they could not have come out of um, scientific processes or natural processes, this is a tentative proposal, which even, um, uh, what's it called, Christians and agnostics have recognized in their thesis. So you're saying currently science is not an explanation for some of these things. Therefore, God did it, which is as God of the gaps no, argument. No, I, I agree. That is a God of the gaps argument. No, what, yeah. what, what, I'm, what, what I'm personally saying is it's not just examples of uh, extraordinary complexity uh, and, and design that we see in, uh, in the example you gave and, and the DNA and so on, but also in the things that uh, are apparently very straightforward and simple, like a glass, like a, a glass of water, H2O has the most miraculous properties um mm. without i mean videos have been made by as a scientist in brazil he was an expert just on the miraculous qualities of water h2o quite extraordinary so it, it's not the uh the, the gaps it's the the plain the evidence in in plain sight sure sure so yeah it, yeah, yeah sure occasion of uh awe uh, and and reverence and praise to god i mean uh for his 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah yeah so 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 but you see that's the distinction between a general design argument and intelligence design Intelligent design is saying that there are there are currently gaps that evolutionary biology can't explain. Ergo, there's a designer, and I'm saying that is a tentative proposal. That is right. not the same thing as what you're saying that there's apparent design. 
I don't yeah. argue against apparent design in nature. Neither does the Quran. And the Quran. So no, that's that's not, that's not being contended. Okay, that, that's helpful. You, 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 that's a more nuanced thing, and I, I'm 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 with you now. I, when I uh, when I talk about design, I'm talking about in that broader sense. Yeah, the broader sense. No one design denies. In a, in a glass of water, as well as yeah. design in DNA or the laws of physics or a flower sure. or a bird. Uh, sure. It's every it's everywhere, literally sure. everywhere. But rather sure. than in the in those things, we can't quite explain in a DNA. sure. Yeah. Just because we ha we're at a scientific block does not mean that God did it. And that's a very tentative p place to put your position in. Now, th now, here's the thing. People extrapolate this argument to the origins of life. That's the key thing. Because evolution, if it, if it started off, it started off with an origins of life scenario. Now, in this paper, which, which will be coming out in a few months, we make it very clear the Quran neither negates nor affirms the possibility that there could have been scientific explanation, there could be a scientific explanation for the origins of life. Even the design things that you're mentioning, that God talks about the clouds, about the rain, about weather patterns, all of them have scientific explanations. All of them have it, right? The Quran affirms both that there are such things as miracles, which you can't explain, which you won't be able to explain, and there are things in nature that are designed. But God doesn't negate scientific explanations for their yeah. reality. Can I question that, actually? Yeah. Well, seriously, you mentioned that the science can explain the weather and so on. Does it? Yeah. Because doesn't science just assume the laws of physics? Mm -hmm. Does it not just assume the existence of the universe we have? Does it not assume um, uh, the, the existence of, of, of the world in such a way that these weather patterns can happen? Does it not assume... I can go on. There seems to be a whole bunch of assumptions here. And then given all that... Oh, and now it can explain the weather, but it hasn't. It hasn't really deeply explained thing. It simply, at a certain level, uh, described the physical processes involved in the weather changing or it raining or something. But it hasn't actually given us a complete explanation of anything mm -hmm. uh, it, because it hasn't. It hasn't even explained why the universe exists at this moment. All the laws of physics. All, all so and so on. You see what I mean? So it, it, yeah. it's a it's a relatively surface description. Whereas it doesn't go deep down into the totality of it, which it doesn't explain. I, I haven't come across an explanation uh, that I'm aware of, and it can explain all of these things. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just a biogenesis, but uh, the, what, why the universe bothers to exist at all at this moment, why the laws of physics are what they are in the incredible fine, you know, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, so um, I think we have to, at least this is my understanding, right? That I think this is where the distinction between metaphysics and science kicks in. Science, uh, I don't believe, is scientism is when you believe science can solve everything. I yeah. fundamentally reject that. And I think all Muslims will reject that, right? Now, if you keep science in its place in that it is an explanation given certain things, as you yeah. said, the fact that there are laws that exist, fine, science can do it and find these patterns in nature and put yes. scientific equations in them, map them out. No yes. problem. Science can do that without an issue. Yes. And, 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 and that's the point that's being articulated here. Just because we have a scientific explanation for something complex does not mean God is out of the window because contingency is the foundational principle here. That's why in Ash'ari theology, whether you have design or not, you still have God. And, that, and my point in, this, in, in my book and in my paper is design is not being negated, but the fact that these design-looking features can have scientific explanations should not worry us or worry our faith. If one day people find an explanation for the origins of life, my faith would not be shocked even an inch. But I know that some people, they are resting their case on this scientific gap to prove God exists. And that is the worry that I have with this ID argument. I, I, I sincerely worry for Muslims who have taken on ID as a theological construction, which is what yeah, I'm yeah, I, I, I sympathize with them, though, because with the, the ascendancy, the seeming ascendancy of methodological naturalism becoming scientific uh, scientism with the ascendancy of scientism id pushes back on scientism it rejects it and says look you can't explain everything you know there's this there's this there's this there's this so it looks like a a, a theological response to a rejection of and critique of scientism which yeah. muslims go yeah yeah that's great because we need a pushback on this so i can understand why e even if you're right why uh why is ultimately unnecessary position to take i can understand why it's so popular on a human level mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah no i, I mean like th this is the key thing that you're always going to get variations in responses look depending on which part of society you're looking at academia theologians seminaries the laity etc so you'll always have that variation and i can see the appeal i used to be an id advocate eight years ago i'll right. make that crystal clear 
So I used to be that. When I started learning theology, I, I, and, and, and I make it very clear that I personally adopt the Ash'ari theological model, not with any like, you're wrong, I'm right mentality. I'm just saying, this is my position, and there are other positions. Okay, fair enough. If that's your model, fair enough. That's, that's what you believe in, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm very tolerant about what other people believe. But I'm saying that this is the model that I occupy. And for me, if there are explanations of these things, eventually, it wouldn't harm my faith. And I think we need to stop putting, uh, basically, uh, this was a conversation I was having with a few people. No, I'm not going to mention their names. But um, uh, yeah, uh, so, and, and I made it very clear to them, and they agreed with me on this, is that um, ID is... It, 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 even though it has this appeal to being uh, a, a very um, intuitive answer to a lot of things, the problem with that is, is that it, I feel this is a science in the Quran argument 2.0, where people first believed in the Quran because there's scientific miracles. The moment you show that there are no scientific miracles or this is a very weak argument, people start reading their faith in. Hamza Sources, the most famous uh, uh, you know, apologist in the Muslim world, he had to take a U turn. On scientific miracles of the Quran. And I believe if we latch on, I'm saying we as in, as in the Muslim community, if we latch on to ID as the next best thing in the world, I believe in a couple of decades' time, if there is a you know a, a viable explanation for the origins of life, it will do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm worried about. Like I, I said, I, have no problem. I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Scientism, mm -hmm. definitely I don't accept. I believe in a soul. I believe there's an immaterial reality to us. I believe that science can't explain that. I'm not saying that science can explain everything, but I'm saying that where there's, where there's openness in scripture and your theology for scientific explanation to take place, don't put yourself open to falsification because that's what ID is doing. You are opening yourself unnecessarily to falsification. And that is the danger I see fundamentally ID. Not with the idea of this intuitive understanding of design, but the fact, this insistence that there are gaps in nature and you have to believe that these gaps prove God that is the danger. That is the danger I see with ID. Okay, that's a powerful argument. That's a powerful argument. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, was that the the last slide in your presentation? Yep. That's oh, it. <laughs> the most important. Uh, here we are, folks. His email address. Any questions? Well, he's giving you his email address. <laughs> um, um, okay. Well, that's uh, that's very, very, very interesting indeed. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor, for your time. Um, I'm very heartened to hear um, that uh, well, you're working on six books and that there's more to come from your um, highly productive pen. Um, and this is clearly something worth uh, watching, this whole discussion. And uh, I, I like your nuanced, very nuanced approach, bringing theological perspectives as well as a grasp of the, the science uh, whether it be scientism or methodological naturalism, um, uh, and it is a, it's a complicated, multifaceted subject, a multi multidisciplinary subject yeah. um, as well. Um, Can I which, add to that, Paul? Just uh, just what you said here. So, because of the multifaceted nature of this conversation, I believe that the layperson in particular is overwhelmed with so yeah. much, and, and I think that's why it's very easy to kind of latch on to easy scenarios whereas the deeper you get the more you realize there's space here for dialogue and for construction and so that's what i want to do through my book and you know these exchanges that we've been having so i hope even if you disagree with me i don't have a problem with people disagreeing with me uh that's absolutely fine but at least try to understand what i've written and then build your you know opinions off of that regardless of whether you agree with me or not, that's not the point here the point is at least just acknowledge that there are some options there for you and that's enough for me to kind of settle the conversation okay now um i've said before i said again the uh, the link to uh the book on islam and evolution um will be in the is in the description below um you click on that you can read the book for yourself i think it's was it 120 quid or something in if you were to pay <laughs> yeah, 120, 120 quid yeah uh, <laughs> some outrageous sum but here uh the publishers uh quite legally are, are allowing us to everyone uh in the world to read it for free um and it's certainly as i say there's some fascinating oh here we go uh endorsements on the back cover but from le leading uh islamic intellectuals uh hamza uh hamza yusuf and um dr yasser Khadi, uh as well as non-muslim intellectuals in the field of science and faith uh from oxford and other places as well so it's, it's clearly um uh got some credentials shall we say um, so uh, it's worth looking at. It's a long book, but um, I haven't read all of it. I read selected parts of it, but it's certainly 
um, very well written and readable. That's the other thing, by the way, is readable, which is really important if you're reading a long book, that it's not yeah. unreadable. Um, no, well, initially, um, in the contract, I signed to a, a, an agreement that this is supposed to be a 90,000 word book, but because I wanted to make it accessible, it ended up becoming a 140,000 word book. Uh, but, but I did it for that reason, because I wanted anybody who had no background in any of these conversations to be able to pick it up. Like, okay, this, this does make sense. I can read this. Yes. No, and, and indeed, it, indeed it does. So um, I, I think, I, think I, I, am, I am persuaded that you have presented a compelling argument uh, and, and that um, evolution is not a problem. However, however evolution is understood, uh, macroevolution is not a problem for, uh, for Muslims. But there, there do appear to be one or two traps that we might fall into uh, in, in, if, if we're not careful, it seems. So um, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time, sir. Um, extraordinary uh, presentation and much food for thought. I hope viewers will uh, consider the options, maybe download the book, have a look at it and, um, and give us your views, please, in the comments below. So um, thank you very much indeed, sir, for your time. Thank you very much for inviting me, Paul. I appreciate it and hope we can talk again. Indeed. Till next time. Bye-bye.